All right, good morning. Um, it is with great joy that as a member of the search committee uh, that I can announce that we have chosen a candidate to bring forward to um, Consistory, and Consistory has approved for us to bring forward to the congregation. Um, it's been an honor to be a member of the committee that's been entrusted with making that decision for our church. Um, this morning, I'm excited to announce that we have Daniel Stanley here. Um, he's our top candidate, and um, he's here to lead us in worship this morning. As a committee, our families have had uh, the joy of spending time with them this weekend. Kendall's sitting in the pew with them this morning, so she's cozied up real fast. Um, but Daniel is here with his wife, Megan, and their children, Lauren, Caroline, and Jack. So um, if you guys want to give them just a warm welcome. They come to us from Joplin, Missouri, and it's been amazing to see God's handiwork just in our visits with them this weekend. You know, we come from completely different places, um, but ultimately we all worship the same God, and it's just been very, um, it's been very fun to see how the kids interact and how the adults interact, regardless of, you know, the differences in where we live. Um, it's been very comforting to know that as a body of believers, that that is something that brings us together. So. We pray diligently for their family and also for the church um, as we've made this decision. And we feel that Daniel is the person that God has in mind um, to lead Salem Reform into its next chapter. Um, so without further ado, Daniel, if you want to come forward. I'm just going to say a quick prayer, um, and then John has an update on their great-granddaughter that he would like to share with the church as well, okay? Dear Lord, we thank you for Daniel and Megan, Lauren, Caroline, and Jack. We thank you for bringing them here safely this weekend, and God, we just pray that you'll be with them as they adventure out of here this afternoon. Um, we thank you so much for the time that we spent with them, and we pray that we will have the opportunity to do so for many Sundays going forward. Please be with them and bless them and help us to look to you in all things. In your name we pray, amen. Get a hold of Kim. Oh, didn't get a hold of Kim um, to put in a bulletin. But anyway, news about our great uh, granddaughter. Uh, I know the congregation has been praying diligently for her and her family, and uh, we appreciate that. In behalf of uh, Everly's parents, uh, if they would be here, and they're in Adele, Iowa, but they would want to thank you all for your prayers. So the news is she was in the hospital for one month straight. They had her, um, uh, what would you say, sedated, and uh, so she's really weak, but she did come home Tuesday of this week. And two, three weeks ago, it didn't look very promising for her. But that shows what prayer can do, and we appreciate the prayers that you have put for her. And so she still needs our prayers because she's weak now, being she was sedated for a month laying down. But when you pray for the family, make sure you also thank our God for the miracles that he does. Do not forget to thank God. And thank you all for your prayers. Well, that's a great, great uh, update. We appreciate you for sharing that. It's always good to hear how God's at work. We have really, my family and I have really enjoyed our time here. And we have decided that we're willing to move here as long as Steve and Christy will let us move into their house. <laughs> Because I've never seen a group of kids kayak that much. We were driving, uh, trying to find their house, and our GPS was taking us down the road. And, and one of the kids said, wow, I, I hope they, or I wish they lived in a house like that. Look at that lake. Sure enough, our GPS turns us right into their house. <laughs> it's meant to be. What is good to be here, as Leah gave uh, the, the introduction, which I don't think I've ever been called the top candidate anything so I appreciate that um, my name is Daniel and my wife Megan and Lauren and Caroline and Jack are all here this morning and we have just been overwhelmed with just a feeling of love and acceptance as the committee has just done everything in their power just to welcome us 
and to make us a part of your tight-knit uh, community here. And we're very, very thankful for that. I was asked to give just a, a quick announcement. Um, if you will look in your bulletin, the Rocky Mountain High Youth Group, the high school kids, grades 9 through 12, are going to be heading out to Estes Park next weekend. And if you know anything about high school kids, they like to eat. So they need lots of snacks, lots of drinks. If you can donate that, lift them up in prayer. They're going to be leaving at 9 in the morning. So make sure you remember the, the six kiddos and definitely remember the adults who will be accompanying them there. Our call to worship this morning comes from the book of Psalms. It's Psalm 100. And it says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much, so, so much for your goodness. We thank you for the hospitality that your people here have shown us over these past few days and just getting to see the community, getting to see the church, getting to meet people, getting to see everything, just your work here in extending your kingdom in these surrounding communities. Little Rock, and in the surrounding area. God, we ask now that as we come to this time where we begin to we begin to quiet our minds and quiet our hearts, God, we ask that you would just begin to speak to us. You would just make your presence known, that God, you would calm our hearts, that you would take away our fears, and Lord, you would help us just as we seek to worship and glorify you. God, for the next hour, draw us into your presence, into your courts, into your throne room, so we might catch a glimpse of your glory. We might understand how deep and broad and high and wide is your love for us. And God, we might worship you and be better because of it. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our opening song is hymn number 17, Great is Thy Faithfulness. I invite everyone who is able to go ahead and sing, uh, stand as we sing.
Be seated. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. I was told there was a problem, but I'm getting the thumbs up. Okay, great. You know, you all warned me that if I started to get boring, you would turn me down, so. <laughs> Our call to confession this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Romans. It's Romans chapter 3. And the Apostle Paul writes, What then? Are we Jews any better off than Gentiles? No, not at all, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive. The venom of snakes is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Let's take the next 30 seconds, next 45 seconds, just to quietly confess our sins to God. And then I'll call us together with his words of pardon. Hear now the words of assurance. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall be like wool. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. From all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to confess our sins, to come to you, God, not as righteous, not as worthy of acceptance, but God, coming to you as broken, as people who are sick and in need of healing. Lord, we rejoice in the fact that you are a God who is gracious A God who has promised that you will never cast away any who comes to you. A God who eagerly seeks to bless. And so, Lord, I know this morning that there are lots of people here who are frustrated, who are filled with anxiety, who feel like they're just disappointed and their hearts are full of discontentment. And God, I ask that you would just begin to work your healing grace, your healing medicine into the hearts of your people, that you would begin to wipe away their sins, just like the fog from the early morning vanishes, God, as the day goes on, I ask that their sins and their failures and their shame that they feel would just begin to lift, and they would know your great love for them. God, you are a great shepherd. You're our great healer, our great physician, and our great redeemer. And God, I ask right now that you would begin to work in the hearts of every single person here. And that you would just give them the medicine, give them the healing that you've promised so freely and abundantly in the gospel. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, do God's people have any prayer requests that they would like to be offered this morning? I know my family has one. 
we made it here. It was a seven and a half hour drive from Joplin. And we're not going seven and a half hours back home. We are going 20 hours to Destin, Florida. Got three kids, 12 and under. They are fantastic kids, not the best car riders. <laughs> Love you guys, but it's true. So we could definitely use and appreciate any prayers for us as we travel, prayers for safety, prayers for sanity, as we make our trip and spend some much needed time relaxing and uh, with family. Is there anything else? Okay, let's pray. God, we thank you for this opportunity, once again, just to come to you in prayer. Lord, you're our Father. We're your children. You're always anxious and eager and so happy to sit down and listen to us. Just talk to you. You love to hear our voice. You love to hear us try to speak even when we can't articulate the things that we, that we know we need to say or want to say. When we can't find the words that we, that we need. God, we're so thankful that you are our Heavenly Father. That you don't get mad like, like sometimes earthly fathers, like we get. That, Lord, you don't get annoyed, you don't get frustrated. But, God, your, your heart is so eager to bless. Your heart is so bursting with love and compassion. That, Lord, you just anxiously await your children to come to you in prayer. And so that's what we do right now. Lord, I lift up this church, this church body, Salem Reformed Church. God, I ask that for each and every person here, that you would heal their hearts, that you would heal any animosity, that you would heal any grudges, anything that's going on. I ask, Lord, that you would fill this church just with the spirit of affection, with brotherly love, with compassion for the community. I see it in abundance, but God, I ask that you would fill them more and more. Father, I do pray for an under-shepherd to take care of them, to feed them, to nourish them to lead them just like your son did when he was here on earth. Lord, I ask that this church would, would do lots of good in the community, continue to do so, that they would do lots of good for one another. But Father, I ask that above everything else, before and more important than any of those things, Lord, they would know your grace that they would understand the gospel of free grace, that they would understand the gospel and how much you love them, how much your son loves and gave for them, and how the Spirit has promised to never leave or forsake them. Lord, I ask that they would know your grace. I ask, Lord, that they would grow in this grace as they're transformed more and more into your likeness. Father, now hear our words as we come together and pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we're going to collect our tithes and offerings, so I'll ask the ushers, the deacons, if they could come forward. And we're going to be singing my wife's favorite hymn, Be Thou My Vision page 400.
Let's pray. God, we thank you for all of these tithes and offerings. We ask that you would just use them for the extension of your kingdom and for your own glory. God, I pray that you would bless every person who gave freely this morning out of a cheerful heart, because, Lord, you gave us everything. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this is what I've been waiting for. Kiddos, if you guys want to come to the front. a good group this morning. Good looking group. All right. All right. Can anybody, can anybody tell me, other than my kids, what this is? Robot. Yes, it's a robot. A transformer. It is a transformer. All right. Adults. Millennials. Who can tell me what this is? People my age? Not just a Transformer. It is the Transformer. Optimus Prime. Now, he's missing, he's missing a head. I got him 35 years ago. I took such good care of him. I gave him to Jack. Jack, could you raise your hand? You raise your hand? You want to tell him what happened? Gave him to, gave him to my pride and joy, and, and he left his head in the yard and his dad mowed him. <laughs> 35 years. This has been the greatest Christmas present I have ever gotten. I re- it does look like a fire. You know, he actually kind of transforms into not a fire truck, but a diesel truck. I went downstairs in my house about 35 years ago for Christmas. This was the only present I wanted. I ran downstairs early in the morning. I saw bicycles out. I saw lots of presents, and so I went, I shook each one. I got a basketball, I remember, because my mom was a really bad rapper, and, and she would just wrap the present up. And I could bounce the basketball. I got a long hockey stick. She just put some wrapping paper around it. And I looked all over, hoping that I would get this transformer. I opened every single present, everything that had my name on it, and when it was all said and done, I did not get Optimus Prime. I was so sad. I was happy with all my other presents, but I was so sad that I didn't get my favorite present. So I went in my little corner and I played with my toys for a little while. I sat on my bike, I rang the bell, started started eating, you know, the stuff from my stocking, my my candy and, and bubble gum and looking at my baseball cards. And then my dad walks into the back room and he comes out. And he says, hey, I've got one present that I forgot to give you. And he pushes out the present, and I'm shaking. I'm so excited. And I open it up, and guess what's inside? Yes, the Transformer, this guy right here. And he is so cool. He can transform. I feel like this is the first time you've had a minister ever attempt to transform a Transformer. In service. Now he's very flexible, but he goes out into this really. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> Jackson? If you push the right button. Uh oh. Man, I tried this right before I came in at work. Oh, there we go. You can get it. Well, hey, I've done this. I've done this a few more times than you have, I bet. Okay, look at this, guys. Optimus Prime Battle Station. Isn't that the coolest toy you've ever? Probably not. I thought it was really cool. He can transform into a diesel, but the part that that helps him broke. I've got a question for you guys. Okay. Can I go by Daddy? You can go by Daddy. Have you guys ever had something that you really wanted? Like, I mean, you ask your parents, and you beg your parents, and you nag your parents for a present. 
that you want more than anything else? How did you feel if you got that present? How did you feel? Really good? Really happy? Oh, you still don't have it? Well, yeah, your, your mom's mean. That's, that's one of mine, yeah. yeah. Do you think God ever wishes he could get an Optimus Prime? Maybe not Optimus Prime, but what would he want more than anything else? What do you think? If there's just one thing on God's wish list, God has this long wish list and there's only one thing on it, what do you think it would be? Any guesses? Yes, Jackson? Humans, yes. I think that is a really good guess. Jesus told the story. He said there was a man who was digging and one day he found treasure. And he was so excited and so happy he went and he sold everything just so he could get that treasure. And you know what that treasure is? I think, yes, it is you guys. The one thing that God wanted, the only thing on his wish list, the thing that he was willing to give up everything for to get, is you guys. You are his Optimus Prime, but way better. You are that thing, that transformer that makes God's heart happy and rejoice. All right, let's pray, guys, and then we'll grab some candy and we'll head back. God, I thank you so much for these kiddos this morning who've come up here, and God, I just ask that you would just bless them all. Such sweet kiddos, and I just pray, Lord, for each and every one of them as they grow up and, and, and grow in their knowledge of you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, thanks. Oh, hey, thank you, buddy. And as the kids are heading back, if you have your Bible and want to follow along, we'll be in Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. In case you guys couldn't see the kiddos' faces up here, not impressed with Optimus Prime. <laughs> well, this morning we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. This is my favorite book in the entire Bible, one of my favorite passages. And in it, Paul writes, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that, na- that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him, and he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have this morning, just to hear your word read, to hear your word taught. So God, I ask that you would prepare our hearts, that you would prepare our minds. Lord, help me just to do a faithful job of 
exalting Christ and of simply explaining this passage for the benefit of your people. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Many years ago, I came up with what I thought was the perfect idea. Instead of proposing to my wife unexpectedly and having a a pre-picked out engagement ring, I thought, hey, my wife is going to have to wear this ring forever. I should let her pick out what she wants to wear because it's her ring, it's her hand. So I went and I talked to her and she said, yeah, that's a great idea. We have a ring that we've passed down. I believe it was my great, great aunt. Uh, this beautiful engagement ring that, that she got from a, a local jeweler in town. And I went and I was, I was extremely proud of it. And I said, hey, my mom wants you to have this ring. It's so pretty. My great aunt had it. We loved her so much. Look at how unique, how beautiful this is. She took one look and said, meh. So I said, okay, we can go and find something else. So we went to all the different jewelers in town, and we would look at all the rings, and she would try them on. She found one. If you want to see it, if you want to see it after the service, I'm sure she'd be happy, happy to, to show you. It's not as pretty as my great aunt's ring, but it's still, a, it's still a good ring. But one of the things that I noticed when we were going to all of these uh, stores is that the jewelers had a fairly similar order of events. They had a fairly similar um, just way of doing things. We'd walk into the doors and they would say, oh, hey, how are you? How did you guys meet? How did you guys fall in love? And I'm the big skeptic. I always thought, they're just trying to butter us up. So we'll spend a whole lot more money. We'll talk about how much we love each other and how you know just madly in love we are. And then we'll spend a lot of money on the rings. Um, and Megan, you know, she would oblige and she was more, more willing to talk about that. But one of the things that I noticed that really just made an impression on me was every time we'd ask to see a specific ring, the jeweler would say, sure, of course. And he would get his keys out from his back pocket. He would open the the sliding glass door, pick out the ring, and he wouldn't hand it to us and he wouldn't lay it on the glass. He would always say, wait one second. He'd reach into his pocket and he would lay out this beautiful dark cloth. It's either black a really dark purple. And I always wondered, why are they laying out this really dark cloth and then placing the ring in the middle of it? And so I, you know, did some, did some research, asked some of my friends, and one of the reasons, and if, if anybody here is a jeweler, please correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the reasons is because if you go into a store that has nothing but these beautiful gems and diamonds, these lights just blaring on them, it's kind of hard to pick out one specific ring because everything's beautiful. Everything's reflecting. Everything's shimmering and shining. But if you lay out this really dark cloth and then lay a ring in the middle of it, your eyes and your attention are immediately drawn to it. It shimmers. It shines. It's so beautiful. It catches your eye. And you think, this is so beautiful. I think that's what the Apostle Paul is doing here in this passage. He's wanting to tell us how much God loves us. He's wanting to show us how amazing God's grace is. But he doesn't just start talking about God's love. He doesn't say, let me show you this beautiful diamond of God's grace. He says, no, no, first, let me lay out this cloth, this dark cloth. Let me show you your sin. Let me show you your shame and your failures. And then in the midst of that cloth, let me lay out God's grace. I mean, think about it. If you have a flashlight and you want to know how bright it is, you don't take it out in the middle of the day and shine it at the sun. You take it into a dark closet. Turn it on. You say, oh, okay, this light is really bright. And in the same way, God is wanting to show us how his grace abounds and his grace abounds in the midst of our sin and our shame. Look at verse number one again in Ephesians chapter two. Paul says, and you were dead. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. That word dead for a Jewish person like Paul meant a lot more than it does for people like us. When we think of death, we get sad and we think of our grandparents who have passed away or one of our friends who have passed away. 
and we're sad. We miss them. We think of it that way. We think, well, they're in a better place now. We don't have to worry about them. Not for the Apostle Paul. Not for Jewish people. Death was the ultimate travesty for a Jewish person. There was nothing worse. There was nothing more sad than death because death meant that you were unclean. And you were unclean forever. If you were unclean, you couldn't go to the temple and be with God's people. You couldn't go into the temple and be with God. You were forever cut off. You were forever unclean. You were forever, you were forever lost and wandering. And the Apostle Paul says all of us are cut off from God. All of us are in this state of uncleanness. The prophet Isaiah says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it can't hear. But our sins have made a separation between us and our God, and our iniquities have hidden his face from us so that he cannot see us and he cannot hear us. Our sins have separated us from God. Paul is laying out this black cloth and showing us how we're unclean, how we're separated how we're lost, how we're undone. Now, I know you all have heard lots of sermons before, and I know at this point you're thinking, okay, Daniel's going to start talking about sin. I'm not going to start talking about sin, don't worry. I thought of a better way to describe what the Apostle Paul was getting out. Instead of looking at specific sins, I want you to think about this. There's this concept, and you don't need to know this, but I'm going to tell you anyways. There's this concept called the Mysterium Tremendum. The Mysterium Tremendum. All it means is the terrifying or the terrible mystery. Now think about this for a second. When I was coming up to Iowa, I had no idea who I was going to meet. No idea who I was going to talk to. Kind of people, you know, were here. No, no clue. I consider myself to be a pretty good basketball player or at least at one time, many, many years ago. Now, if my identity were wrapped up in that, in basketball, if that was the thing that was the most important to me, how good of a basketball player I was, what would have happened when I got here and I met Casey and his brothers? Now, I'm about 6'1". Well, he's about 6'6". I played basketball in high school, and we were pretty terrible. One time in seventh grade, I had like a game-winning shot. Well, he, he played college basketball. He won a national championship. So who's, who, who's better? I know his hand's messed up, so maybe I could smack him on his hand and, you know... But if that was my identity, and I would come into Casey's presence, immediately I would start to say, well, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't really care that much about basketball. It's not that big of a deal. But could you imagine if I got up here and Michael Jordan, arguably the greatest basketball player who's ever played, was here? And I was just start, you know, I was telling you all about my basketball exploits and how great I was. And then what would happen if Michael Jordan walked in? I have a, a little state championship ring. Well, Michael Jordan has six pumpkin-sized NBA championship rings. If he walked in and sat on the front row, immediately I'd shut my mouth. Immediately I'd be quiet because I was in the presence of human perfection. Here's a guy who is a true basketball player. I thought I was, but I'm not. This guy is the ultimate, the pin-ultimate basketball player. And I'd start to question myself, have an identity crisis. And I'd start to draw, draw back because he's so perfect. He's so excellent. Take all of that and apply it to God. We're pretty good people. I honestly, I honestly can say I don't think I've met better people anywhere than right here in Little Rock, the surrounding communities. But goodness here compared to the goodness of God, a big difference. 
What's going to happen when we stand into God's presence? Not in the presence of human perfection, but divine perfection. Twice this has happened in scripture. I'm just going to give one example. The prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah was a very educated person. Spoke God's words. He was fourth or fifth in line to be king, from what I understand. He wrote a massive book, book of Isaiah. Very good person, and one day he goes into church and he sees God. This very holy, this very righteous, this very just man, Isaiah, this prophet, he sees God and he cries out, Woe is me, for I am undone. That word woe is what a prophet would use when he would be pronouncing a curse on a rebellious people. He would say, Woe to you people, God's going to bring judgment on you. Woe to you people, W O E. He was cursing them. Well, the prophet Isaiah sees God high and lifted up in all of his glory, and he pronounces a curse on himself. He says, Woe, cursed is me. I'm cursed. I am undone. That word undone means to unravel at the seams. Isaiah says, I'm cursed. I am literally tearing apart at the seams because my eyes have seen the Lord, the King of glory. Can you imagine what that will be like when we see God face to face? This mysterium tremendum, when we see him in all of his glory and all of his splendor and all of his majesty. We begin to come apart at the seams. This is what the Apostle Paul is talking about. He lays down this black cloth And he says, you might be good, you might be great, but what's that in comparison to this perfect God? He lays down this black cloth and he says, you were dead, but he doesn't stop there because then he immediately shifts and he lays out this beautiful diamond of God's grace. He says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. I had some terrible, terrible babies growing up. Um, My kiddos, my two girls, I love them. They are so amazing. And I hope you all can meet them and talk to them after the service. They're, they're phenomenal. Thank the world of them. They were awful as babies. My oldest, Lauren, she slept for 24 hours after she was born, and I think that's the only time she slept that entire first year. (laughs) One time I was so frustrated and angry at 2.30, 3.30 in the morning, she was screaming and flailing in her bed and kicking and throwing stuff, trying to hit me and her mom, and I went in there and I was done. I was completely done. I I don't know if I was going to, I don't know, but I was not happy, and I was full of fury. And I went in there just to let her have it, I guess. But when I saw her red puppy cheeks and her watery eyes, it just melted my heart. Utterly melted my heart. I picked her up and I said, honey, it's okay. I'm sorry. I'm here. I don't need sleep. I don't need to calm down. I just need to hold you because I love you. Her naughtiness, her awfulness, drew out my fatherly love. And that's what God, the Apostle Paul is saying, happens right here with God. This black cloth that lays over us and our heart draws out God's fatherly affection. He sees us. His heart breaks for us. And he rushes to us to save us, to cleanse us, to remove this cloth and save us. I only have time for one story, but it's one I definitely want to share. You can go back and you can find this. And I don't know if you've ever thought of this, but this used to drive me crazy. You all remember John the Baptist, how he would baptize, and everybody would come to him, and they would confess their sins, and John would baptize them, and then they would go up. So they would come down and they say, John, I've committed this sin, adultery, I've committed this sin, murder, I've, I've stolen from people, I've, I've done all these bad things. 
And so they'd come down into the water and they'd be baptized. Then they'd go back up. One of my favorite movies is Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And one of my favorite scenes is when the three criminals who are running from the law stumble through the woods and come upon a baptismal service. Two of the criminals rush down into the water. Now, these are bank robbers, these are swindlers, these are con men. They rush into the water and they're baptized and given white robes and they come up. And the, the imagery is beautiful because they've just washed away all of their sin in the water, right? They've washed away all of their sin. George Clooney mocks them and he makes fun of them. He gives them a hard time, but you know, they start confessing their sins and they say, I've knocked over the piggly wiggly, but the preacher said that was forgiven, that it was washed away in the water. The other one said, I did this, you know, but my sins were washed away. Why was Jesus baptized? You ever thought about that? John is calling all of these people to repent, to come into the water, to wash away their sins so they would go down dirty and they would come up clean. But Jesus had no sin, did he? He was completely perfect. He was spotless. He was the lamb of God, this white, beautiful lamb. Why did he need to be forgiven? Why did he need to wash away sin? Everybody went into the water to wash away their filth, to wash away their sin, to wash away their guilt, to wash away their shame, and they came up as white as snow. Jesus was the only person who went down into the water, white, and came up dirty. Jesus went down into those baptismal waters. He saw all of our sins, all of our shame, all of our guilt, and he took every single bit of it upon himself. The gospel is not try to be a better person. It's not try to help your neighbor out, try to do as much as you can for your community. Those are great things. It's not try to be a, a great citizen of your state and of your country. It's not go to church and work hard. It's not anything other than simply seeing that picture of Jesus and all of his compassion and all of his mercy, taking our sin, taking our shame upon himself. That's the gospel. Not that we need to clean up our lives. Not that we need to try our best, but we need to stop trying to impress God. We need to stop trying to impress other people and simply focus on that beautiful diamond of God's grace, of God's generosity. If you feel guilty, if your conscience is unclean, if you've committed sin, look to Jesus. It's as simple as that. Look to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, God may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You are that treasure that Jesus was willing to sell everything for. He was willing to lose his father's love. He was willing to lose all of his glory, the worship of angels. He was willing to lose his splendor, everything that he had, even his own life. But he was not willing to lose you. That is that diamond. That is that beautiful diamond placed in the center of that black cloth. Focus on that. Focus on that and let it melt your heart. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this beautiful diamond that you've given freely to us. We are your bride. We are your spouse. You are our husband. And Lord, I pray that we might know your love the height, the depth, the length, the width, all of it, God. That we might begin to understand it, that we might begin to see the beauty of your grace, of your heart for your people. 
and we would be melted because of it. Lord Jesus, you are a great Savior. And so I ask this morning that you would save us all, that you would melt our hearts, that you would fill us with your love, and you would change us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd stand to your feet now, we're going to recite our common confession. And confess our faith in God. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and buried, and he descended to hell.
Well, it's, good. it's been good to be with you all. I just want to emphasize that once again. We appreciate all of the hospitality. I'm going to do my best to shake each and every one of your hands um, and just express our gratitude for, for this weekend. It's been great. But now receive the Lord's blessing as we depart. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever.